Good evening. I'm Jeffrey Sachs. I'm the director of research here at the Agnon House. Welcome to those of you that are, that are with us tonight. We know that there's a lot going on in Jerusalem tonight, so we thank you for choosing to be with us. But here during the book festival, every night there's something literary going on in every street corner. It's one of the beautiful things about living in Jerusalem. Um, uh, welcome to the, to the Agnon House. We hope you have a chance to, to look around. And uh, certainly please sign up at the desk for our newsletter and like us on Facebook and follow us for all of our activities. For the English speakers of whom you are counted, uh, we'll be starting next Wednesday, exactly a week from tonight at 7 p.m. We're starting a new three-week series of talks uh, in English on Agnon, uh, the Jerusalem of Agnon. Not Jerusalem of gold, but Jerusalem of Agnon. Uh, Agnon stories of Jerusalem for three weeks, uh, for the three weeks leading up to Tisha B'Av, and we'll be principally looking at stories in this collection in English, two scholars who were in our town, and other stories, which is available here uh, at, uh, at the desk, or in local bookstores, or just come along to listen to the talks. You won't be graded on the homework whether you've done the reading or not. Before I introduce our very special guest, our friend Vasil Mashno, uh, I am very pleased to turn the microphone over to my good friend Natalia Fedushach of the Ukrainian Jewish Experience, which has been such a good, good friend to what we do uh, here at the Beit Agnon and has brought together the Agnon House of Buchach, the actual Agnon House of Buchach, with the actual Agnon House of, of Jerusalem, and we were always so Happy to see you and continue to work together at the important work that we do. Yes. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, a Ukrainian Jewish Encounter was founded in 2008 with the goal of having a dialogue between Ukrainians and Jews. And since this period of time, you know, we've supported conferences, book fairs, festivals, have had academic conferences have worked on a shared historical narrative that looks at the Ukrainian and Jewish experience um, on the territory of Ukraine. Certainly the war, uh, Russia's, um, I will say, criminal war against Ukraine, um, has really upended everyone's work. Um, however, we are very glad that we were able this year uh, to bring uh, Vasil Makhno to Israel. We had planned to do this um, at the beginning of 2022. Um, and so Vasil, it, he is a Ukrainian poet, uh, essayist, author, one of the great literary voices in Ukraine. He is winner of Encounter the Ukrainian Jewish Literary Prize, which we founded in 2019 for his book, Eternal Calendar, Vichnei Kalendar, uh, uh, he will, um, a copy of the book is here. You can read excerpts of that work in English and in Hebrew on our website at ukrainianjewishencounter.org. Also, we are presenting, we, I have given you um, a copy of uh, his uh, bilingual work, which are Ukrainian poems that have been translated into Hebrew. Although this book was published a while ago, this is the first time that we are presenting this book uh, in Israel for uh, a Hebrew and Ukrainian language audience. And so I think tonight's discussion should be very, very interesting. You know, Jeffrey and I have now had a very long relationship um, and, uh, you know, many discussions over the phone, in person, um, and via Zoom. So. I will turn the floor over to you. And once again, thank you for coming uh, this evening to this beautiful home. Uh, my father was born in Buchach, and I've had the opportunity to be there many times. So without any further delay, Jeffrey, Thank please. you. Thank you so much. Uh, since, since our friend Natalia has already introduced you, Vasil, I can, I can skip that aside from saying that you really are a very, very important and original voice in Ukrainian literature, uh, although you have been living now for 20, almost more than 20 years in, yep. in New York, uh, which creates an interesting parallel to, to our own great author, Agnon, of what it means to be a writer in exile, writing about a world from which you 
are at home in, but at remove in. I always say about Agnon, who left Buchach when he was 20, and except for one very short visit, essentially never returned, but you can take the boy out of Buchach, but you can't take the Buchach out of the boy or out of the author, and I know that you feel the same for that very same region, what we, what we once called Galicia, uh, which today is now, of course, Western Ukraine. And I wanna come back to actually what is happening in Ukraine, the, the atrocities that are happening now in Ukraine, and talk about what it means to be a writer creating literature for that world and that culture at this particular time, but we're gonna save that uh, for a little bit later in our conversation. I want to first focus on on your work as a poet, as a prose author. You have these two really interesting novels, which unfortunately I am unable to read in, in the original. The first is Eternal Calendar, and the other is a work in, in progress, nearly nearly finished, coming out, coming out soon, called uh, called the the angel and the the angel and the donkey. Now, for those of us here, uh, synagogue goers and uh, Torah readers, uh, we know that this week, the day after tomorrow, we'll go to synagogue and we'll read the Torah portion of Parashat Balak, the story of the angel and the donkey, which serves as a basis for your work. And your stories are replete with descriptions of events in Jewish history, Shabtai Tzvi, Hasidut, in your new book, there's a character named Shmuel Yosef, Shmuel Yosef Chachkis. Uh, he's the son of Shalom Mordechai Chachkis. These are figures that we know. Now, they're fictional figures in, in your hand, on, on your pages, but this is, this is our Agnon, of course. Uh, someone reading your works, before we even describe what they are, will obviously remark that this is a very, very Jewish author. <laughs> but but in fact, just so there should be no mistake, you, you are not in fact, you are not in fact uh, Jewish. How do you come to write works of such Jewish urgency? Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, I'm honored to be here in uh, the beautiful place and uh, um, Beit Agnon. It's my second visit to, to this place because uh, my first visit um, to Israel and especially to Agnon House was in nine years ago. Um, yes, I'm Ukrainian in both sides, <laughs> completely. Uh, when I was five years old, my parents divorced. And uh, my childhood was in uh, my grandparents in the village. It's a village 30 kilometers uh, behind the uh, short queue. And my uh, grandpa was born in 1916 and grandma 1923. And that generation, uh, his generation, they are. Uh, 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 lived in during World War II. And uh, I often listen about uh, villagers, and my grandma and grandpa told about uh, Jews. And my question was, where Jews right now? Okay, during the war, it's a very complicated time, and um, German killed he, that many of, of uh, Jewish people. It's the first time I met with Jewish only in my image, right? Like, uh, like uh, uh, your imagination. Imagination. It's a, a like a like symbolic meeting, right? The next one, uh, when I was student of university in the first year, I uh, take bus through Bucic. And uh, I probably in, in the center was a renovated uh, for, for that uh, street and bus uh, right the tour. And when we uh, ride on the slope, I see many, many stones. It's a, it's a, it was uh, uh, Jewish Kirkut, but 
I'm saying it was a Jewish. Kirkut, in the cemetery. Cemetery, cemetery. cemetery. Yeah. Is Kirkut in, 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 in oh no? No, Kirkut. I don't know. I'm not sure what that word is. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, the first time uh, meeting, I, I, I see, okay, what is that? And uh, when I start writing, uh, I think in, okay, I was born in Galicia. It's a multicultural place and land. And uh, in one essay, I <laughs> wrote about that, that place uh, something. Uh, I talk about Galicia mentioning that Austrian and Poles lived in their own state. Jews lived in their own books. And we Ukrainians lived in our own land. It's uh, mm, some kind of metaphor, right? But in that metaphor, um, it makes sense it's for me. Um, when I started, uh, mm, wrote that the eternal calendar, uh, that that's uh, some kind of epic novel because uh, uh, I describe four centuries from 17th centuries to present time. And uh, if I ask it myself, okay, that land multicultural, the many ethnic lives in that uh, in Galicia, I must describe every ethnicity, every minority and relationship between uh, each other. Uh, that, uh, and that started, started um, make some kind of search. I buy books, I uh, read articles, I have consultation with uh, many scholars, uh, especially for Jewish question with um, Johann Petrovsky Stern, yeah. uh, who from universe, from Northwestern the University, Northwestern University, a scholar of Eastern European Jews. Yes, and uh, that's why um, mm, that's why uh, that for me uh, in contemporary Ukrainian literature and contemporary times in Ukraine, it's very important uh, to show our readers. Uh, about multicultural uh, situation in the in the Galicia and whole Ukraine, of course. Um, frankly speaking, um, uh, for me, uh, that uh, Galicia is very rich material for writers, and I remember about uh, uh, about uh, Agnon, about another. Uh, Jewish or Ukrainian writers who uh, describe this situation. Ivan Franko or, 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 or Timofey Burdulak in, in, in Ukrainian side. Uh, today uh, in Ukraine is a terrible time. Yes, we have war. And uh, if we come back to see history and developing history through 20th century or early, we take uh, some kind of uh, d uh, open uh, viewing on our uh, nation, our culture, and our land, and what happened today, and uh, what will be in future. So in, in her review of uh Again, sadly, I'm unable to read the book, although it is coming out soon in English, yeah. The Eternal Calendar. Yeah. Um, in her review of the novel, uh, Oksana Rosenblum writes that the Jews, uh, as depicted in the novel, and again, the, the false messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, 17th century figure, uh, you know, which belief uh, in that false messiah and the eventual catastrophe of the letdown had colossal impact on Eastern European Jewish life. And you use this as a metaphor uh, for all types of disappointment and, and 
disaster that cutting across all of the multi ethnicities of, of the place. So she writes that in, in your book, Jews should not have trusted messianic ideas of Shabtai Tzvi. The Jews of Galicia should not have trusted, later they should not have trusted, the Germans based on a feudal hope that they would behave like a normal nation steeped in the culture of Goethe. Ukrainians knew what to expect of the Soviet invasion not the current Russian invasion, the yes, Soviet, Soviet invasion then. Yeah. And yet nobody imagined it would be as horrible as it all turned out to be. Everyone naively trusts in what's coming. They're terribly disappointed. They suffer trauma and defeat and catastrophe and collapse and invasion and incursion. And w w What are you trying to say about these tides of Jewish history from the 17th century through the 20th century and then I guess with implications for what's going on today. What are you trying to say about this lesson of history through this novel? Uh, it's a very interesting question because the, in, the, in this novel... Because again, in other words, they're all, in other words you, you use, the, you use the, the, the historical episode of Shabtai oh, Tzvi yes. as a kind of metaphor sure. for all false hopes, all hopes that are dashed up against reality with catastrophic result. In other words, uh, Sabatianism becomes a metaphor for everything, for, for the Soviet Union, for all false hopes, for all types of false messiah. Yes, um, because um, in, the, in that text, in the novel, um, I describe that uh, every 30 years in, in Galicia, uh, war is coming in Galicia. And uh, all ethnicities um, has uh, ruined life. If uh, we are going to talk to a false messiah or false ideas or false uh, images about life, about future, yes, uh, that uh, Sabbatai TV uh, is the kind of and uh, uh, I describe in the first uh, chapters, it's a time of the 70th centuries, and uh, most about uh, Polish Ottoman. Uh, <laughs> uh, Polish Ottomans uh, war. In the second chapters, it's uh, about uh, World War One. In the third chapter, about some kind uh, uh, World War II and uh, uh, after that. Uh, yes, in my mind and uh, in my point of view, uh, on, on, on uh, that uh, history about what happened in, in, in this land, and it's a metaphorical because I want to combine the local history and universal history. And uh, uh, I uh, deeply understand that uh, local history and universal history link it. Uh, e what happened in the church of, uh, in, in Buchech, uh some kind of during the war or, or during the uh, uh, peace uh, period of life, that um, explosion to world history because every scene uh, has a threat each other. And uh, my idea in that, uh, in that or, or my message on the, the, this uh, uh, novel that calendar, something calendar, eternal cal calendar or historical calendar uh, often uh, return in the new level. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, right now, uh, in this book, uh, I told about war, but we have, we live in currently time where war in, 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 in uh, Ukraine is a present. 
we, we're going uh, we're gonna to read a, uh, an excerpt in English uh, from, yeah. from the book. But before we do that, just by way of honoring the Ukrainian language, I want you to read the opening passage in Ukrainian. Okay. I don't think any of us will understand you, but I want to hear the music of the language. It's always okay. important to, to, hear the, to hear the rhythm and the music of, of the language. Uh, in it's order a good to idea. Something. Thank you. It's a, it's a point that when, when, when teaching Agnon in English to people yeah. that are unable to experience him in the original, I often will do that the same. You have to hear the author in his original language, even if you don't understand it, even if you're reading it in translation. Okay. It's an uh, uh, excerpt from the uh, first uh, part uh, of the uh, first chapter. It's a title, Messiah from Smyrna. Rozpoczynaje nasza historia z tego, що восени 5426 року від створення світу і 1666 року від Різда Христового і 1115 року за вірменським літочисленням і 1776 року мусульманського календаря Гіджри з порту міста Ізмір відплила галера Баштарда. Подія, на котру можна було б не звернути уваги, якби цією галерою плив до Стамбула хтось інший, а не Сабатай Цві. Ізмірський мешканець, який оголосив світові про своє месіанство. Надходили роки, у які тривожно вчитувалися юдейські книжники та християнські богослови, щоб зрозуміти, що чекає цей світ, а очікували вони приходу Месії та кінця світу. I understood Shabtai Tzvi. But it, it is a way of, also it's important for us to, in addition to honoring the language, to recognizing that most of the people in the world today that... I would like to... Yes, but what, most of the people in the world today who could have understood that, unfortunately, are in a situation where they probably don't have the luxury to sit and enjoy fine literature at the moment. So it's important, doubly important, yeah. that we should read it. But here's, here's an excerpt in, in English. In English. Translated by Eli Kinsella. The Messiah from Smyrna. Our story begins in the autumn of the 5,426 years since the creation of the world. The year of our Lord, 1666, the year 1115 according to the Armenians, and 1076 in the Islamic calendar of the Hijri era, when a galley bastarda sailed from the port city of Smyrna. It was an event that could be easily had, be, had been overlooked if someone other than Sabatai Tzvi, resident of Smyrna, who had proclaimed his messiahship to the world, he sailed on this galley to Istanbul. The years had come that the Jewish scribes and Christian theologians were peering into the order to understand what awaited this world. They were waiting for the coming of the Messiah and the end times. Hence, the quarrels in the synagogues couldn't, couldn't be quelled for the scribes following along the every letter of the Torah and licking their fingers unfurled the scroll of parchment to grasp of the words, first in their eyes and only then with their minds. Christian theologians such as Ioanniki Galatovsky were convinced that only Christians upheld the laws of Moses and would be therefore be saved. Astronomers peered into the starry sky looking in divine signs so they could be first to notice anything that might end. At some news of the end of world, it was known that before and that time there would be come false messiah, wars, hunger, disease, and floods, and the great mayhem would reign over the people. In London, in London, for example, the plague raged brought to Dutch merchants. Chief secretary of the Admiralty Samuel Pepys writes in his diary that after he crowns order to put down all dogs and cats, 
that the range of the plug expands. All summer the city, city's reds spread the fatal, fatal disease while the inhabitants of London carries corpses from their homes and filled them up in the streets because there were no cars to take them to the cemeteries. It was only at the start on September that the royal baker forgot to extinguish the, uh, the oven. He was baking bread for the court and half of the city burned down. Along with the building, the carriers of all the disease and also burned at everyone who evacuated London returned. They, there, there were some other events around the world that everyone has forgotten, so we cannot recall them there. But that Sabatai Tzvi, who divided the world into 26 parts, offering them to his followers, was not in the least concerned the empires and kingdoms had long possessed what they was easily given away. The Ottoman and Roman empires, Spain and Portugal, the Tsardom of Moscow and Queen Dynasty in China, Patriarch Nikon's abdication and Isaac Newton's discovery of gra gra gravity, the gunboat war between the English and the Kingdom of Denmark, and the first Armenian bi Bible published in Amsterdam. Everything that is connected by the invisible thread of history lived them in anticipation of the end times, because the end times are always with us. Wow. Elisa, you had wanted to ask yeah, a question a moment ago. I had a question since for a large period of time the language of literature and so forth in the Ukraine was Russian. Was there ever a decision between writing in Ukrainian and writing in Russian? Uh, okay, the, the same question. In, in case uh, everyone didn't hear, the, the question was the tension between Russian as uh, one's official language and Ukrainian and the artistic decision which language to write in. Uh, you know that uh, Ukrainian literature and Ukrainian language has uh, 1,000 years. Uh, we always was divided between Eastern world and Western world. Uh, from 18th or 17th century, Ukraine was divided between Russian Empire and Austro-Hungarian Empire. In the Russian Empire was a struggle against Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian intellectuals, in the, in the Ukrainian language. In the western uh, side, the Austro-Hungarian Empire... Where Galicia was. Yes, Galicia was. Support Ukrainians for kept, uh, kept uh, language, culture, uh, etc. Uh, during the Soviet period, we have Ukrainian literature, we have Ukrainian speaking people, we have Ukrainian schools and high schools and universities. Yes, that large of population, Ukrainian population, not only Russians and especially in, in Ukrainians, speaking in Russian. Be gr growing up, Russian was your school language? Your, no, your no, your, because I'm... Your, your home was Ukrainian, yes, your school was Ukrainian? Yes, yes, because I was born that my parents was a teacher in the uh, hi high school, right? And uh, we, uh, all generation of my family, uh, spoke in Ukrainian and uh, uh, our identification Ukrainian and our culture Ukrainian. Yes, I one time for five years I lived in the Kriverich. Kriverich it's an industrial center of Ukraine where I was born, uh, for example, a Zelensky president. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that that uh, city uh, most uh, speaking Russian. Yes, of course. But why? 
because in during Holodomor 1932-33, many Ukrainian peasants was killed. Like yes, it's a it was a, a genocide against Ukrainian nation. After World War II, uh, many uh, uh, people from whole Soviet Union going to Kriviri because it was an industrial center, had a good salary, etc., etc. Of course, in this uh, city, most people speaking Russian. For example, my parents is teaching. I live in building. In our backyard, Russian school. That uh, my parents make decision. Guy, you will be studied in Ukrainian school. And every day I take trolley bus, I took tro trolley bus and ride in 40 minutes to Ukrainian school. It's uh, some kind of, of, uh, of uh, identity and decision and link it to uh, our native culture. Because so uh, the parallels to the Jewish experience of uh, ch children growing up amidst a culture that was not fully theirs, but yet the sacrifice of their parents and the dedicated to, to go to Hebrew school or to go to Jewish day school and to not be removed from their authentic culture. The parallels are, are, yeah. are to speak for themselves. Although in a way it's reversed, right? Because, because, they're because they were at home. Right, right. They were Ukrainians at home. But but the but the dominant culture was a Russian culture. Right? Yes, and that that uh, uh, um, situation also from Russian propaganda, because Russian propaganda told that in in Ukraine many many people speak in Russian, like Russian culture, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not true. As Mr. Putin made it clear that he was he was sure, doing everyone a sure. favor by Absolutely. bringing Russia back to Ukraine. Absolutely, and. Uh, 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 of course, we have problem with that, but uh, I think in that after war, where we will be victory, uh, that situation in uh, Ukraine, inside U Ukraine, with the culture, with the language and school, etc., etc., will be completely changed, because many U Ukrainians who speak. Uh, uh, Russians right now forgot Russians and began to speak Ukrainian. Sure. It's a moment uh, for, I think, that national mentality change. Uh, your books have been translated. Your books have been translated to Russian. Yes, and some how, of books. How have they been received in Russia? I don't know. <laughs> 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 uh, that. Uh, my uh, old presumably book, they've been uh, removed my from the my old book <laughs> and moment. my some kind of publication in a major of Russian uh, literary magazines. Uh, all publication was a uh, before war. Yeah, right. Yeah. Before war. Well, I, I had I had intended actually since we kind of uh, digressed. digressed into the topic. Uh, let's let's face the elephant in the room. It's a very very difficult moment now for Ukraine as a nation, for the Ukrainian people, wherever they are in, in the country, in the, in the Ukrainian diaspora. And as is always the case when these things happen, and of course we Jewish people know this uh, probably better than most, it becomes both a difficult moment, but an opportunistic moment for culture, for Ukrainian culture. Now here you are. You're, one of the most important articulate voices in Ukrainian letters today, although you live for over two decades abroad. How do you feel the events of the war impacting on your writing, on your poetry, on what you're thinking about, on your, on your future projects? How is this shaping your work? Uh, in uh, February 24, when I read that Russian brutally attacked Ukraine, 
I wrote uh, my first poem about war, title War. Mm. Oh, yes, I, this was published in the uh, Los, in Angel Los Angeles Review yes, Books. Right? That yes, that my yes. uh, translators immediately translated into English, and uh, in short time, uh, Los Angeles uh, review, uh, review Books published that poem. And during, during probably two months, I uh, wrote uh, 15 or 16 poems about war. And this, this poem was translated on the huge languages. Mm -hmm. In the Poland, do you know Krzysztof Czyżewski? Who founded uh, uh, Pogranice? Foundation po Pogranice, it's uh, some kind of uh, borderland. In the oh, same, yes, 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 you know yes, that yes. guy, yes. And uh, Krzysztof made decision uh, to start published Ukrainians books of Ukrainian poets about war. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the currently time, probably twenty books uh, in both language, like like that uh, bilingual Ukrainian and uh, Polish, published in this, that that uh, publishing house Pogranice. Uh, I wrote a uh, couple essays about war. I uh, was invited to BBC Radio in London, London and uh, Turkish TV, mm -hmm. uh, Georgian TV, etc., etc. And I spoke about war and, and my impression about the war, like a writer and like Ukrainian, right? Um, I think in that uh, 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 well, let, let me the, the, uh, the poetry it, it's uh, immediately reacted on that this event, right? The war, but the prose for prose we need that time, mm -hmm. you know. And right now in Ukrainian uh, uh, publishing house. Print, uh, uh, printed uh, that some books, uh, doc documentary book or some diary about uh, or anthology of poems or short stories uh, about war, but uh, that uh, um, novels and deeply understanding what happened, I think will be in the future. Well, so that's an interesting observation that you're both a prose writer, you're a yeah. novelist of multi-hundred page uh, novels, and, and also poet, and you have different tools in your toolkit uh, to respond as an artist. Um, and, uh, you know, when Faye confronted with this, uh, this traumatic event, you, the first tool that you reach for is poetry. Yeah. And uh, so, but why, why is poetry a better vehicle for immediate response? Or, uh, or alternatively, why, is, why does prose take more time to, to ferment before it's ready? Yes, because that uh, for write poetry I need uh, approximately 15, 10, 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> no. But that prose, it's a hard job. And uh, the prose has a plot, has a characters, has a many, many... Uh, uh, many backgrounds, uh, it's and just harder than yes, think, and uh, writer must be thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, I think that that poetry uh, in in, uh, in Ukraine uh, uh, it's a traditional situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the poetry dominated, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the many of Slavic literatures, poetry dominated. It's yeah. a, you know, it's uh, some kind of tradition. <laughs> well, uh, be it prose or be it poetry, what, what is the role of an artist or an author? What is the task before you in responding to what's happening to your nation and your people? Uh, you know, I uh, deeply understand that even poem uh, doesn't stop any rockets and bombs and tanks. If only it would. Uh, but uh, the human has soul, and humans needs uh, needs uh, 
understanding because the words has a uh, mm, has a power. Uh, if you read Bible or Torah or Shmuel uh, Agnons, that uh, the combination of the sentence has a power or, or uh, under that reader, right? And uh, that power, I think, that uh, needs uh, for uh, dramatic uh, times for our country and our nation. And uh, many, many uh, poets of Ukraine, Ukrainian poets, right now open, uh, I think, that second front. <laughs> it's a cultural yeah, front. Cultural front. Yeah, yeah, cultural front, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, sure. So I'm curious about the relationship to Russian literature and Russian opponents to the Ukraine war. Other Russian influences on Ukraine and Russia and literature and vice versa. The question is about yeah, yeah. Russian influences on Ukrainian culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, mm, yes. Uh, Russian literature uh, was inf influent in the, uh, uh, Ukrainian literature. Uh, we have, for 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 example, in in, in Kiev was born Mikhail Bulgakov, um, uh, Osip Mandelstam. Uh, a couple years uh, of his life lives in in Kiev. Right, um, but uh, but after revolution, when uh, Bolshevik took power, and Ukrainian communists, uh, especially writers like Khvelyovay, uh, he told that uh, for Ukrainian language. We need reject Moscow. We need reject Moscow. Why? Because uh, because that influence has a positive and negative moments for Ukrainian literature. Uh, during uh, 20 centuries, many of Ukrainian authors would be happen to link and open Western culture and Western literature. But that dominated of Russian in the world, because uh, many of people uh, around the world uh, are now uh, uh, knows, uh, only about Russian culture, only about Russian authors, only about Russian uh, opera, music, etc. But uh, somebody hear something about Ukrainian culture, about Ukrainian opera, or uh, about Ukrainian composers, about Ukrainian theater? No, right? Why? Is that question why is it important for my generation? We not rejected or banned Russian literature or Russian culture, but we uh, try to uh, search another way for our culture, another way for the, our literature. And that uh, today, that war showed to us, yes, it's a very different time. And uh, finally, we must say, stop. We Ukrainians, we have whole culture, we have everything, and uh, we must be going to world stage. I want to, uh, we have only a little bit of time left, I want to turn our attention to the new book, to uh, The Angel and the Donkey. Uh, before we do, explain to us what is this imagery of the angel and the donkey, which again, as I mentioned, is from this week's uh, Torah portion. Okay. That that uh, that uh, novel will be has a uh, uh, very complicated <laughs> structure <laughs> because that uh, uh, story about 
Ukrainian writer who lives in United States. And uh, he met uh, on the Sla Slavistic Conference in New Orleans uh, uh, a professor of Hebrew literature from Jerusalem, from this uh, university. His, uh, her name uh, Esther Krautkopf. <laughs> Cabbage. <head. laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, between each other, that romantic relation, that Esther, uh, 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 okay, and that uh, guy uh, going to Ukraine because. Uh, his father died, and he must sell his uh, uh, family apartment. And when we stay in uh, Ukraine, Esther sent to him messages. Where are you guy? I'm in Ukraine. Okay. You uh, could be help me? What happened? Please go into Buchach. I start uh, working on the book about Agnon. Please go into Buchich and search some kinds of materials, maybe what have, you know. And, uh, and that main hero, main character came to Buchich and uh, uh, he looked in the uh, library, the place of uh, ruin of uh, the synagogue, that place that yeah. old year. And he understand that uh, no materials Nothing, nothing survives. Nothing survives, and etc. etc. It's a very long story. And why Angel and that guy writer uh, uh, also write the main book of masterpiece of book of his uh, literary career. The title: The Angel and Donkey. <laughs> Because uh, he stay uh, in old city, and one time on uh, in his mind, mind uh, uh, he thinking, okay, I must write about biblical time. That angel I about the Christianity story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a very complicated structure and very, uh, but I'm going to finish work in progress. But uh, that uh, I hope and I believe that book will be published in 2024. So, so this, this the, the excerpt that we have in English is the opening of the novel? No, no. Uh, no. So that uh, that uh, one and third uh, a part of the yeah, novel so will be about uh, contemporary time, and the second dedicated to Agnon. So the, so we have an excerpt of that section available in English. It's on the website in English and, and in Hebrew. Um, and it begins with, that section begins with a kind of foundational myth of Buchach. Now for readers of Agnon, we already have the Agnonian version of the foundation of Buchach. But since Agnon sees everything through the prism of the Jewish experience, Buchach begins when the first Jews arrive. He is almost oblivious to the fact that there may have been another nation mm -hmm. uh, that, had, that had lived there. And his story, which is told in at least two different places in Agnon's writing, perhaps most forcefully in his long collection of stories about Puchach called Ir Umloa, a city mm -hmm. in, its, in its fullness, uh, is a distinctly Judaized version of, of this. It's a story of actually, is, of course, uh, Buchach is a very Zionistic town because when the Jews were arriving there in the Middle Ages, they were actually a group of Jews that were just passing through on their way to Aliyah. They, did, they weren't even sure where the land of Israel was, but since they prayed to the east, they figured it was in the east, they head out on a journey, and then you know, you get to Buchach in, in the winter, it snows a lot, and they get stuck there, and they've been there ever since, he writes. But yeah, the, the, for, the, for addition, for my experience, when I read uh, uh, Agnon's uh, novels about Buchich, about uh, and I thinking, okay, where is the Ukrainians in Buchich? Right. Where is the Poles in Buchich? Where is the Austrian Buchich? Right. Only Jewish. Yeah. Okay, it's a what very, is the it's a very insular portrait yes. of, of yes. the world. Yes. So let me, if if you'll allow me, I'll read just one excerpt from here. Yeah. It's the introduction to Buchich, and then we're introduced to a character 
called Yehuda Farb, who is an important townsman of Buchach, has a son-in-law, Shalom Mordechai, who goes to the family fur trade, who has a grandson, Shmuel Yosef, who becomes the great Hebrew author. The story begins like this. The town was as tiny as a bird's egg. But what kind of bird could have laid it? A magpie, a hen, or even perhaps a firebird? In any case, it rolled down to the ravines along the Strepa River where it cracked open. And when it did, people with cattle and fowl walked about. Birds scattered about. Beasts and serpents crawled forth. Wheat and oats were sown. And trees and bushes bloomed. Thus the town took root along the Strepa. Later, it matured, first stretching out along the river. For a while, the high hills slowed its growth. Later, the trees appeared organically, first parallel to the river, and then branching through the valleys and ravines, resembling a peeled off eggshell from above. On some day of some year that no one quite remembers, Jews arrived in the town. They stopped at the river, bought a plot, and set to building. The screech of their carts carrying sandstone for the synagogue, mikveh, and homes pierced the town's air for 50 years. Then it finally came to a halt, with only their base oilum on a hill outside the city growing. They brought with them scrolls and velvet embossed with square script and carried them into the first synagogue, which they would later call Old Synagogue. They had booths in the markets, open shops, and every Saturday, quiet descended over the quarter, impressive for its age. The descendants of ones who spilled from the bird's egg and first settled those steep slopes from the stripa passed through the stillness more than once without understanding why the city was so quiet. Perhaps it was this calm that filled the universe when the creator first decided to make the world in which a place was eventually found for a town called Buchach. And then you introduce the Agnon family. Now, what is Agnon doing? How did he find his way into your novel? Mm. Uh. Which, is, which is also my way of asking about your relationship with Agnon, the influence of Agnon on your writing. Oh. And that uh, story began uh, in early 19s, 1990s, when I first met uh, Agnon's daughter, Emuna, in Ternopil. She came uh, with uh, uh, her husband and Argentinian TV television company. That television uh, create a um, movie yeah, about, about European uh, places of Agnon. And I strongly remember that Emuna write in, in my notice her Jerusalem um, address. Mm -hmm. He write uh, Emuna and Chaim uh, Yaron. Yaron, 19 Washington Street, uh, Jerusalem, Israel. And she told me, maybe you could uh, you can visit to to Jerusalem? I think okay. I, I have approximately thirty years. I think okay. That way is a Jerusalem, way is a Chernobyl, <laughs> way the I, Okay. You might as well soon get to the other side of the moon. Oh, absolutely right. And uh, uh, we talking about uh, about um, his father, her father. Uh, very uh, uh, shortly, uh, because and uh, and I visit uh, Israel and Jerusalem eight years ago. I asked my friends where is the Emuna Yer Yeron, the daughter, and um, some someone told me, uh, unfortunately, she had just passed away. Yeah, they passed yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, I should just I should say that Emuna Agnon Yaron, Agnon's daughter, yeah. uh, who, who spent her life, grew up in this house, uh, was his literary executor. She published more of his writing in book form after he died than he did in his own lifetime. Her contribution, her involvement yeah. with his writing is, is cannot be understated. That uh, uh, 
in this uh, future in my novel, uh, I want to describe some kind of uh, situation between Judaism and Christianity. Some kinds uh, of uh, uh, mm, life of the someone uh, writer, yes, especially that uh, main character and uh, Agnon's life. And uh, uh, I also linked that text to Galicia and linked the text to small city of Bucic because that uh, uh, action in this um, novel will be uh, in uh, Bucic, Ternopil, Bad Homburg, and yeah, city in Germany. Yes, in yes, in yes, the and, Jer and Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, and also all in, the, in all New the York. stations of Agnon's uh, yes. life yes. intersecting with your own yes. life. Yes, yes. How interesting. But I don't uh, write uh, Agnon's literary biography. Right. It's a fiction. Mm -hmm. It's a many, many uh, 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 details. Um, I uh, think, in, okay, I don't know what the what exactly would happen in his life, right? Mm -hmm. But I. Uh, make construction of characters f because uh, that writing or, or novels must be interesting to readers. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, uh, show the readers that interesting person, not only positive or negative. It's uh, like uh, black and white, mm -hmm. li like the uh, slope and down. Mm. Uh, those that visit Puchach, as I have as Kitty, you were with us in Puchat, weren't you? Oh, and, and Karen also traveled with us in, I guess that was 2018. We were together in Puchat. Um, I had plans at least twice to go back, once canceled because of COVID and once canceled now because of war, and I hope I'll get there again soon. But when you, you go to Puchat, it's this charming little city, and you can tour around, as you can see in this video exhibit that we mm -hmm. have here. If you, from if you kind of close one eye and ignore people carrying a cell phone and uh, modern automobiles, you can imagine that it's not much different than it was when Agnon was writing about it, uh, stories that are set at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, they're very proud. Of, uh, there, there are no Jews today living in, in, uh, in Bujaj, but they are very proud of the local boy who did well, the great author that came, that sprung from amongst them. And of course, there's the Agnon Literary Center, which is a project uh, supported by the work of the, of the UJE and our good friend Mariana, uh, you know, under great struggle now is, is keeping, keeping things going. Uh, but in normal times, it's an important cultural center in the city promoting literature and culture and, and uh, poetry and all types of things in memory of Agnon. And, in Agnon's, in Agnon's spirit. So what's interesting, of course, is that in Agnon's writings, the most important character, the greatest literary character, the li greatest literary creation is the narrator himself, is this character who we, the readers, fall immediately fall into the trap mm. that this is autobiographical, that he, the author's done nothing more than project himself into the stories, although, of course, that's, that's a, a trap that the, set, that the author sets for, for, his, for his readers. So for you, to create a fictional literary character named Shmuel Yosef Agnon is the most Agnonian, the most Agnonian turn, turn of all, and I'm sure no one would be more delighted than he to discover himself in a Ukrainian <laughs> novel, uh, you know, written, written in the diaspora. Yes, because he understood what it meant to do that. So I think that's a, a, an excellent way to kind of uh, focus our mind around, mm -hmm. which we're all looking for. Well, we're. The world is looking forward to be published in any language, and then hopefully soon we'll, it'll be available to us in Hebrew, in, in English, and other things. We have time for a question or two, and then we really must wrap it up. Yes? Yeah. Um, I couldn't help thinking, was it last year we, um, we heard a, a talk here from Jerusalem, Agnon, and he was talking about the Jerusalem Jews, and he said that they were Uh, you know, where she also focuses on Shantai, uh, not Shantai, but uh, Jacob Frank. But yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. The, um, the Ukrainian author, the Ukrainian Nobel laureate. Yeah, she's Polish. Polish, Polish. But still, you know, it, it, it does occur to me that there's something, some kind of relationship between your project 
subject and, and hers. And I was wondering if you had any, something to say about that. Like, why is this, you know, is this something that, uh, you know, what, what, why is this so, so fascinating? You know, where, where do you come from? The mm -hmm. fact that she's mm -hmm. writing from um, the far, the, the more from the far uh, west of, of yeah. Poland, right? And you're kind of uh, from the far far east but still mm -hmm. so, yes um, and I just wanted to tell you also that my, okay. my grandma was from uh, I told you she was from Galicia, and she did she told me she did understand Ukrainian she had a Ukrainian uh, nanny mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh. she was not unaware of the of Ukrainian but another question besides that I, I, maybe this is too much but I had another uh, you know more about the modern thing when the war broke out in Ukraine so many people you know, um, this, you don't hear it so much now, but people here, Jewish people, were rather confused because the relationship between Jews and Ukrainians, as you kind of mentioned, you know, kind of hinted, was not so straightforward. And, you know, the, you know, many people okay, had so said... I think we have like four or five questions here. So let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, you, you can yeah, answer yeah, yeah. any or all uh, yeah. briefly. It came up for me, and I, and I was wondering if, you know, somehow you were dealing with that also, the... Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, um, about uh, Olga Tugarchuk novel, the uh, Jacob's books, right? The title. Book of Jacob, yeah. Jebu, sure. Book of Jacob, yeah. Uh, in, in my novel, Sabatai uh, Tzvi uh, 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 lives in the book only short time. And it's a, another story about... Uh, about that Galicia. The one Ukrainian critics compare Torkarchuk books and my novels uh, and uh, mm, said that that completely different books. But you know, if you have a uh, uh, history and you have one of two uh, uh, historical person and the same some kind approximately says same period you Olga and I describe <coughs> we uh, don't reject any person and that that person historical the, the, the same period in the uh, mostly uh, 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 appeared in the in, in our texts but I'm describe history of um, of Ukrainian Halicia and uh, of course i need some background of jewish life of armenian life of, uh, of austrian and polish life that second your question about ukrainians jewish jewish ukrainians relationship of course it's a, a long story of course we uh, have black and white pages of our relationship of course uh, Ukrainians uh, and Jewish has uh, another religion right Judaism and uh, uh, and Christianity but in contemporary Ukraine and contemporary for my generation we deeply understand to uh, describe our history and our relationship uh, with uh, whole questions, with a good time and a bad time. And for Ukrainians, right now, we understand that uh, we have um any scenes um before Jewish any sins sins any sins and uh we wanted to provide dialogues between our nation uh dialogues with our history, our land, our literature, and that perspective in the future. Because 
uh, I believe that only cultural, only uh, cultural uh, uh, make for us that place where we uh, speaking about all question and uh, answering on all questions. Thank you so much. We have copies of uh, uh, compliments of the UJE. We have uh, copies of the the book in Hebrew or, or English. Uh, and we also, for sale, uh, there are copies of Paper Bridge, which is Vasil's most recent collection yeah. of poetry, uh, translated from Ukrainian to English. People are interested in, in, uh, in purchasing this. And we look forward to the, the arrival of the novels in, uh, in English. And we thank you for your voice and your work. And we pause once again to remember the situation in Ukraine. And we're all hoping for a quick, speedy, peaceful, just resolution to that conflict. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you, audience, for coming. And I feel honored to be here and uh, in this place. Thank you very much.